Today we're going to turn a relatively thin bowl. Hi, I'm Kent and welcome to Turn a Wood Bowl. Today we're going to turn a relatively thin bowl using this big blank of ash. This is white ash and it is going to make a beautiful bowl. We're going to turn it and I'm going to make this relatively thin depending on how big this turns out to be. Now I've got some cracks that have formed in the side and the ingrain of this which is pretty typical. I'm going to need to address those. What we're going to end up doing is shaving this cylinder down a bit so it's probably not going to be quite as large as what you're seeing here but we should still have a nice chunk of wood in there to make a beautiful bowl from. And then I'm going to turn the walls relatively thin. I'm hoping to get down to like an eighth of an inch, maybe three millimeters in that range. I'm not going to make them so thin that they're paper thin. If we have a decent sized bowl with paper thin walls, then it's not very functional. If we have a decent sized bowl, but the walls are about an eighth of an inch thick, then it's going to look really elegant and be pretty durable as well at the same time. Be sure to stay tuned because I'm going to show you a secret way to make the walls of your bowl appear even thinner than they really are. So let's go ahead and dive right in and get started. All right, before I mount this to the lathe, I'm going to measure across the blank and find center or roughly where the center is. Now this isn't perfectly circular, so the center is going to be a little bit difficult to find exactly, but I'm going to get pretty close to it. And the closer you can get to that center, the better, because you're going to, if you're off just a half inch, then you're going to take an inch off of your cylinder. So you want to get it as close to center as you possibly can. Now I'm mounting this with the pith at the base of the bowl. This will be similar to the turnings, or the grain pattern will be similar to the turnings when you do a live edge bowl and that's the whole purpose of putting the pith at the bottom of the bowl and you'll see there's there's a really beautiful grain pattern that will form on the interior of the bowl now this log has some rough cut areas from the chainsaw so i need to smooth that or level that out i'm just going to chisel that real quick the area where the live center from the tailstock side is attached I want to make sure I've got a flat connection there so I've got a real secure base when this is turning. I'm basically just using a drive spur and the live center to hold this in place. So I want to make sure I've got a good connection. Now, what I'm looking for is I want that top rim or what will become the top rim to be relatively flat. The nice thing about this mounting method is I can loosen the tailstock and move the blank around until I get it right where I want it. And it's looking a lot closer. Now, it's not perfectly straight, so it's not going to be perfect, but I can get it pretty close to being true here before I start turning. That's gonna prevent me from wasting a lot of wood. Okay, so I'm using my 5 8 inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge and there was one of those big chunks of the chainsaw splinters, I guess you would call them, on the outside of this blank that went sailing there. There's gonna be a few more of those coming off, I think. What I'm doing is I'm working the corner. Now, I get asked by some people, why don't I just round the outside of the bowl and smooth that out first, and then I can work on the bottom or the curve of the bowl. But actually, it's a little more efficient to do both at the same time. So I'm working on the corner of this bowl blank at about a 45 degree angle. That's going to help me shape the curve of the bowl and also take down those side wings at the same time. I'm positioning the bowl gouge into the cut, moving from right to left, and I'm angling at about a 45 degree angle. If the flute of the bowl gouge is pointing straight up was 12 o'clock, then I'm positioning it at about 1030. And I'm also dropping the handle. This allows the tool to slice through the wood a little bit easier.
This is part of an ash tree from the property that my parents own. Their whole town basically took down all of their ash trees because of the ash borer beetle. And I was able to salvage some of the wood to use for bowl blanks. I've had this around for over five years now, and it's still in good shape. There is one side that was exposed to the elements and dried and cracked a little bit. And we'll get into those cracks in a little bit here. I want to flatten out the bottom again. When you have a rough cut or a torn area, or if it's like roughly cut with a chainsaw, it can be a little bit of a problem to deal with. You, you need to level that out and make sure there's no low spots in there. So I'm just taking this whole area and leveling it down on the face of the bull or the, the base of the bull, actually. And you can see as I'm working this outside curve, I'm both removing material from the bottom of the bowl and from the side at the same time. Because this is rough cutting and there's a lot of uneven surfaces with this turning, I'm putting a lot of down pressure with my left hand. The downforce is what's stabilizing the bowl gouge so it's not getting bounced around. And then the angle of the bowl gouge is also allowing it to only slice a small area at a time. So it's not ever taking a huge bite and getting a, a nasty catch and causing the wood to bind up. So instead I'm making light slicing cuts with a lot of downforce with that left hand that you see pushing the tool into the tool rest. And again, these are roughing cuts, so I'm not really worried about a smooth finish right now. So I'm actually cutting at a pace that's a little bit too fast. That's why you're seeing those lines from where I'm cutting. If I want a smooth finish on there, I need to slow down my pace so that the tool has enough time to make a nice cut all the way across. And this ash is a very hard wood, so I'm going to go ahead and sharpen up my tool before I continue. The biggest thing with your bull gouge is you want to be aware when the tool dulls. You can see the side there is all dulled. That's one indication, but you should be able to feel the dullness. The nice thing about having a good sharpening system like this set up and knowing how to shape and sharpen your bull gouge means the the less amount of time you need to spend at the sharpening station. This is shot pretty much in real time. I only spend a few seconds running the bevel edge of the bull gouge across the CBN wheel here and everything is sharp. As you can see that bevel is nice and shiny and restored. It's sharp and ready to go and I'm ready to jump back on the lathe. Still need to level off the base here. There's still some indentations. Whenever wood breaks or cracks or is split, we never get a really nice, even, flat cut. And there's usually a lot of material that needs to be removed in order to level that area. And that's what I'm doing here. So this wood has been sitting around in my storage for over five years, probably pushing six years now. And it's still in great shape. It's very turnable. There's moisture content in it, which all wood has moisture content in it, but most of the moisture has left this particular piece and it is relatively stable. So I don't have to be super concerned with the fact that I'm just doing a one once turn bowl here. Typically, if you have a green or wet wood and you turn it once, you need to be concerned with a couple things. You need to make sure that your wall thickness is even so that it dries properly without cracking. And you have to be aware of the fact that it's going to warp or distort. Now, we get a lot more into all the details you need to understand about using raw wood from nature when turning wood bowls in my tree to bowl Greenwood Understanding course. This is an online course 
that goes through all the details that you need to know about how to manage and work with wood. Whether you have one or two logs or if you've got a huge tree that you've come across that you're able to process into bull blanks, you're going to want to check out this course because it is super valuable. But what's nice about this particular bull blank that I'm working is that it's relatively dry. So when I turn it, I don't have to worry too much about it warping or distorting dramatically. Now that nub, I'm just going to go ahead and take that down. That's basically the thickness of the material that I had to remove in order to get below that cracked surface. So now we have a level surface to work with. Normally I would brace this up against something like the banjo there, but I wanted to do this in front of the camera so you can see how I chiseled that. Now we're not to our final shape now, so it doesn't really matter if I line this up exactly perfect. Of course, I want to get it very close. I found that this wood, the ash wood, is actually really, really pretty wood. It's got a really nice grain texture to it. It takes finish really well. It's very durable. And it should be able to hold up to a decent sized bowl like this one's going to be with relatively thin walls. Here I'm using my dividers to mark where the tenon will be. I get asked a lot too, why do you do tenons instead of mortises? Well, the main reason I use tenons is because that's how I was trained. <laughs> and secondly, I use them primarily because it allows me to shape the foot of the bowl. If I were to do a recessed mortise, I'm left with a negative cavity in there and it doesn't give me a lot of space to work with after the fact as far as how I want to shape the foot. Like, for instance, with this tenon, if I wanted to take the foot and make it smaller than the tenon, I can do that very easily. If I want to make it deeper than the tenon, I can do that. I really can't do that with a recessed mortise. I pretty much just have to remove the mortise if, at best and have a flat bottom on the bowl. And I really don't like flat bottom bowls. It just gives you a lot of extra options. Now, the other huge bonus is when you have a tenon and a shoulder like I have here right now, now this is my half inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. When you have a tenon and a shoulder, you've got extra buffer material, I like to call it. So when I get down into the inside of the bottom of that bowl when I'm doing the interior, here I'm using my spindle detail gouge to cut the angle for the dovetail jaws. When I get down into the interior of this, if somehow I make a mistake on the wall thickness and I turn the bottom of this bowl too thin, I've got extra material in that shoulder and tenon area to kind of recover from. And that can be a big bonus. And the other thing I really don't like about recessed mortises is because they're going up into the bottom of the bowl, you may be doing the interior of the bowl and not realize that you're making the bottom too thin and then all of a sudden you cut through that mortise very easily. Here it's the exact opposite. I've got extra material from the shoulder and the tenon. So if for some reason it starts getting too thin down there, I can work with what I've got and make some alterations. Here you can see the profile of the bowl. I'm working that side corner and the round bottom edge. Now when I'm turning this, I'm looking up across the bowl at the top of the bowl so I can see that curve. I'm setting the tool up in the cut, but I'm looking across so I can see the shape. Okay, now I just need to knock down that edge. So I'm going to come down to the side and now that it's just a short path, I'm just going to go ahead and knock that down. Because the majority of the bowl is, become, is becoming balanced now, I can speed the lathe up as well. You basically want to keep the speed of the bowl no faster than vibration will permit. So, you, in other words, you don't want in any vibration coming from the lathe when you're turning. 
So if you're feeling vibration from the bowl or if the bowl is bouncing around a bit, you're turning too quickly. I've got a video all about lathe speed that you can check out. And if you're biting off a little more than you can chew there, you just back up and make the cut a little bit thinner and then you can return to the previous cut and make it in two passes instead of just one. Now here I need to pull some material away from the shoulder area and it's not simple to get the tip of the bull gouge in there so I'm going to use a pull cut to reduce the area near the shoulder of the bowl and then I can return up the bowl a little bit with a push cut. Now this is my half inch bowl gouge and this I usually, usually use for finishing cuts. You can see here I'm slowing down the pass just a bit so I can start seeing what this surface might look like with a nice finished cut. Just take your time and make a nice smooth pass across the bowl and you're going to have a really nice surface. There's no need to rush this process. Now when you're roughing out the bowl, you can do that a little quicker if you want, but the finishing cuts you need to make at a, a nice, smooth, steady pace. And I'm still shaping the bowl, so when I went back, I'm looking at the curve and I'm making adjustments as I go. Now I'm going to use the shear scrape to smooth out the transition area. So the area near the shoulder isn't quite the way I'd like it to be yet. So I'm going to remove some material. This is actually a little bit more aggressive. I've opened up that lower wing and I'm actually cutting there. You can see the shavings became a little bit larger. But then if we close the flute so that the flute is almost facing into the wood and but just the bottom wing is touching we can make a really nice smooth shear scrape now this is going to be closer to a finished cut here going nice and slow across the surface of the bowl with a relatively thin cut here and again we're going slow so that the pace allows the tool plenty of time to cut all of the material so we're not leaving any tool marks on the surface now I've got a little bit of a wonky top edge there. I'm going to take care of that right now. Very carefully with a lot of down pressure on the tool rest, I'm just using the lower wing of the bull gouge to nibble off a little bit of the edge and then I'll work my way in just a little bit. What I'm trying to do is determine where the top of the bowl will be. And then to see if I've made a pass all the way around. No, nope, there's still a little low spot right there so I need to remove some more material. You can see some of that crack that we're going to need to deal with. So when I remove this material, now I'm down to a, a consistent edge all the way around the bowl. That will become the rim of the bowl right there. Now remember, not all bowl blanks are nice and smooth and straight. This You can see that it was, it was wonky on the bottom and it's wonky and lopsided on the top, but we're basically going to straighten it all out. And there are the cracks that we need to deal with. So. What I'd like to do with these type of cracks is because I want this bowl to last a long time, so I'm going to use a good quality wood glue, and I'm going to press that glue down into that crack. And then I'm going to remove any excess glue, and then quickly sand across the glue area with the grain of the wood. Now, when I say with the grain of the wood here, I mean the surface grain. You can see those are running at a diagonal. I'm actually sanding in that same diagonal line. And then what happens is, it's kind of amazing, is the glue is quickly, the top of the glue is quickly dried and is sealed with the fine sawdust that's created during the sanding process. 
Okay, so now I want to really refine the shape of this bowl. I'm getting really close, but I've got some extra material at the base of the bowl right above the shoulder area, and I want to scrape that out. I'm using a shear scrape here so that I only remove a very light amount of area of material from the from the bowl. If I were to do a push cut here, there's a good chance I'm going to remove too much material and then I'll have to make more cuts to try to recover from that and then that's simply just going to reduce the size of the bowl. Here with the shear scrape, I'm able to get the shape that I want at the base and as you can see, I'm actually making a little bit of a problem area farther up from the base of the bowl, right there. There's a little bit of a hump. Before I go any farther, I'm going to go ahead and sharpen my bowl gouge again. Now this, again, this wood is very hard, so in the total time that it took me to turn this, I probably sharpened or resharpened my tools about six times, which that's quite a quite often for a bowl, but this is, again, it's older, more dried wood, and this is a very hard wood species, ash. Okay, so now I'm going to go in there and I'm going to shear scrape that area. Now I've got the bowl gouge handle lowered. And you can see the material that's coming off the gouge are very light, thin shavings. That's a shear scrape. Now I'm going to do a push cut. The shear scrape is great for reaching into places that you can't start with a push cut. And that's what that lower area was. So now I'm just going to use, with this nice sharp bowl gouge, I'm going to make a nice finishing cut all across the surface of the exterior of the bowl. Now, remember, the exterior of the bowl is the bowl, meaning this shape is what people see, it's what's gonna define the inside of the bowl, it's pretty much everything. So take your time and make the exterior of the bowl count. Don't race through this process, make sure you get it exactly the way you want it, and your bowl's gonna be that much better because of it. You see those very fine shavings are just removing a little bit of material. I've got a video, video all about the shear scrape. You're going to want to check that out. It's a super valuable technique to use with the bowl gouge. Now I'm looking for any slight high spots here and I'm making adjustments to level those off or actually blend them into the curve of the exterior of the bowl. Okay, so now we're going to reverse the bowl and mount it to the four jaw chuck. So I'll take out the drive spur and add the chuck to the lid. Now when we're turning a thin bowl, it's very important that the exterior turns smooth and true once you reverse the bowl. However, that almost never happens. There's always a little bit of a deviation, a little bit of a high spot. It's turning pretty true here, but what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna start off with my heavy bowl gouge, the 5 8 inch bowl gouge and I'm going to continue the shear scraping on the exterior of the bowl. Now why would I do this? Well the exterior of the bowl has a little bit of a high spot and a little bit of a low spot because it's not perfectly centered in that four jaw chuck. Now I could fuss with it a bit and make it a little more centered in the chuck and that's one way of doing it but that little bit of shear scraping is going to level off that exterior. Had I not done that if I make the walls really thin, you're going to visibly be able to see where the bowl is slightly lopsided. The wall thickness of the bowl will have one side will be thicker and another side will be thinner. And we don't want that. So making sure that it's nice and trued up before we start working the interior is very important for a thin walled bowl like we're going to do right here. Okay, so I'm going to define the rim. 
and I'm making essentially a straight rim edge at this point. I'm not going to curve this. I'm not going to have it dip down into the bowl. I'm just going to make a nice straight rim. And I'm going to start carving out the little ditch area that I like to use. Now, if you've seen my videos before, you know that I like to work from the outside, from the wall to the inside. And the reason for that is, is the center mass of this bowl is holding this bowl and keeping it balanced so there's no vibration in it. Had I started from the center and worked out, so there was nothing in this bowl except the walls itself, and I try to get to this outer wall and make it thinner and thinner, I'm going to see a lot of vibration and I'm going to have tool marks from the tool bouncing against the thin walls as they essentially flap because they're so thin. Well, with the center mass inside this bowl, as I'm working my way down the walls, I don't really have to worry about much vibration at all on those outside walls. Instead, that center mass maintains everything in place and holds it nice and stable so that it can cleanly cut it. So I work down the interior, cleaning out areas, clearing away material so that I can make that wall nice and thin. Now, I'm looking from above straight down on the side of the bowl and I'm lining up the bevel of the bowl gouge with the exterior wall of the bowl. That way the interior path that I'm cutting is parallel to it. So now we're getting closer to our wall thickness here. Holding the bowl gouge at 90 degrees, and that's very important. I'm going to start the cut and then proceed into the bowl. Again, lining up. It's hard to see from this angle, but I'm lining up the bevel of the bowl gouge with the exterior of the bowl. And then I'll work away some more material on the inside and then make that inside passage a little more clear so I can continue the wall thickness. That's feeling really good right there. Okay. Now I'm also going to need to glue those cracks from the inside as well. That way they're secured really well. Now the reason I didn't use CA is I really want this to be a long lasting repair. I want that crack to not reoccur in that location. And CA supposedly over a period of time, say five or ten years, the CA or the super glue basically can start breaking down and we don't really want that to happen so I've got enough space there and I've got some time and the wood glue technique works really well now the idea here of removing the center mass and lowering it is that once the area of the wall has been established you don't really want to return up the wall at all because as the center mass is removed and as the bowl becomes more of a bowl the top edge of the rim of that bowl has the chance for vibrating and moving because there's really nothing supporting it. Now there are some turners that will take their left hand and hold it on the outside of the bowl to stabilize that outside edge. I prefer not to do that. This wood is dry and it's it has it's a strong wood but it does have a brittle quality where it will break and I definitely don't need any shards or splinters getting embedded in me while trying to hold the piece stable while I'm cutting it from the inside. That's a cool little, in my, in my opinion, that's a cool little turning trick to hold the outside of the bowl. And it makes sense for certain things, especially if you have a, a small green, really wet bowl that you're trying to turn paper thin. That might make sense, but I wouldn't do it for a piece like this. Instead, I use the technique that I'm showing you here by using that center mass to stabilize the bowl. I try to keep pretty much all of my body, including my hand, on this side of the tool rest. And I'd rather not be reaching over into the rotating bowl blank if I don't have to.
Now, when I get up to the thickness of the wall, I'm reducing the depth of my cut. I'm kind of sneaking up on that wall thickness. I don't want to make aggressive cuts here. And you can see I'm rubbing the bevel there to find the previous edge. And I've pretty much lined up those two edges that way. It's looking pretty good. It might be a little thick. I probably have to remove a little bit more material there, but it's getting there. You just want to take your time and sneak up on those wall thicknesses. You don't need to rush this process. Now here I'm roughing out the interior. This I can do quickly and I can take big chunks out of it because I really don't care what this looks like. I'll be doing much more refined cuts when I get to the wall. Each pass I make where I'm getting closer to the wall thickness, each pass becomes thinner. Just sneaking up on that desired thickness. There I can see I got an edge. I'll pick up that edge and bring it in. Now the other thing I'm being careful not to do is let the bull gouge touch the right side of that interior cone. If that were to happen, the bull gouge would become overloaded, it would get a catch, and it would it would grab dramatically. As you can see, I've just got a little edge, a little bit of that edge is actually cutting. If I were to let the right side of that bull gouge hit that center cone, it would make a nasty catch. Okay, so I've got a thick spot right here. Whoa, I broke the pencil. I've got a thick spot right here. I'm going to go ahead and mark that. Now, the benefit of using a pencil is so that you really know where you need to be working. When I turn the lathe on, I'm going to be able to see that pencil mark, and I know that's right where I need to make that cut. So I'm going to thin that area down and then merge this whole section together. Right there is where I need to stop so I don't go too far into that side wall. All right, that's feeling really good. It's a, just, a, just a hair. Now here I have the flute almost open, and this is incredibly dangerous if you're trying to make an aggressive cut. However, I'm making a very light cut, just shaving a couple hair widths off of this wood, a very small amount, and it's, it's a very doable cut. You just want to be careful not to be aggressive when you have the flute open like that. I love doing these concentric circles as well. It's almost hypnotizing or meditative to do this whole process. You can see when I'm doing it this way, I'm working from right to left, and I have the bull gouge position to the left in about the 1030 location. And then when I'm making the cuts down into the wall, I have it positioned to the right, and I'm making the cut from left to right with the bull gouge at about the 130 position. This is more like excavating the bowl, just removing the unwanted material and revealing the bowl that's underneath there. The other issue with working from the center out is you're, you may or may not be following the contour of the exterior of the bowl. Remember how I said the exterior of the bowl is the bowl? Well, this method I'm showing you here is allowing us to follow that exterior perfectly right down the side of the bowl without having to guess where it might be. If we start scooping out the inside and work our way to the outside, we may or may not be making a shape that matches the outside. And we may have to remove a whole bunch of extra material in a certain area, or we may come really close to hitting the exterior wall without even knowing it. This way we know exactly where that exterior wall is because we're working right down the side of the wall. Now at this point, with that much of the core removed, I will not go back up to the rim of the bowl. Right here, I'm making very light passes and merging these sections together. 
And this wood, again, is, is relatively dry. I'm seeing just a little bit of movement in the rim, but it's enough that it's going to create chatter with the tool. The tool is going to make tool marks. It's going to be a mess. And honestly, I've seen a lot of people blow up their bowls by going up to the rim right now at this point. If you go up to that rim and you become aggressive with your cut and there's any kind of weakness in the rim, which there is with this bowl because I've got that cracked wood, there's a good chance you're just going to rip that wood apart and it's going to go flying because of the lack of support. I'm going to check the depth of this. Now, this is a depth gauge that I have. I'm going to show you guys uh, this in a little bit more detail in, in, a, in a few minutes. But it's a simple little depth gauge that has a plunger in it. And the plunger is designed to show you up at the top of the gauge how thick the wall thickness is. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm actually allowing the bottom of this bowl to be a little bit thicker than the side walls. Now, why would I do that? Well, I want to make sure that this, this bowl seats well and it's not top heavy or wobbly. And one of the ways to do that is to allow for a little bit extra thickness in the bottom of the bowl. Not a lot. It's, it's less than double the thickness of the side walls that you're seeing here. And that's going to add a little more weight and stability to the bowl as well. Sometimes those nubs don't want to start very easily. You just <laughs> got to let it catch on the side there and work it down. Okay, so now the center mass is pretty much not part of the equation anymore. So we're going to remove it and work our way down to the final bottom concave curve of the bowl. And I'm going to add my J tool rest here so that I can get down there with a little bit extra support. This is a nice tool rest to have for larger bowls. It gives you some more close-up support. I'll put a link to this and all the tools I use for this bowl in the description below this video. And if you guys would like, you can also go to my website at turnawoodbowl.com forward slash gear and you can see all the gear or the recommended equipment that I have there. So we're transitioning down this center area from roughing cuts, which we're just ripping material out, into finishing cuts. And when we get to the finishing cuts, we want to make those slower, thinner, and with less pressure. We want to make them just a really nice, simple pass so that we're not ripping out wood fibers, but instead we're making a nice, clean cut. Now here I'm looking across the bowl at the overall curve of the concave of the interior of the bowl and I'm making sure this is all matching. And it's a little bit high right now. You can see how the bottom has got a little bit of a flat spot in it. And I'm marking where that high spot or the edge of that high spot begins. So I'm going to start right here, take out that pencil line very lightly, and then continue downward to make the concave interior of this bowl. I'm bringing the flute to a 90 degree angle and I'm slowing down at the interior because this is the slowest portion of the, of the bowl blank. And we want to give the wood enough time to be cut by the bowl gouge. Okay, it's feeling okay. I think we need to make one more pass and remove a little bit more just to make that curve just right. Now the walls of this bowl are relatively thin, but I'm going to show you a way, a secret that's coming up that's going to show you guys how to make the wall appear even thinner than what it is right now. Okay, so I'm going to sand the entire bowl and I'm going to work through all the grits. I'm going to go from 120 to 180, 220 to 320, or 240 or 220 to 320.
And always remember not to sand the inside of the bowl while the bowl is rotating. You want to do that with the bowl stopped. And I've got a video that explains why you're going to want to do that. And check that out. I've got a video all about sanding wood bowls. Okay, so now it's time for the secret of how we make that inside edge or the wall thickness appear thinner than it really is. With the lathe rotating, I will use my 120 grit sandpaper and I will ease over the interior edge of the rim only. Not the exterior, just the interior. I'm putting a little bit of pressure on the left or the right side of the sanding pad and I'm just taking down that inside edge of the rim. What I want to do is I want it to appear as if the rim is about half the thickness that it was prior to doing the sanding. And there you can see how the edge looks dramatically thin compared to what it really is. Okay, so now I'm going to apply my finish. This is tried and true original finish. This is linseed oil and beeswax. This is a product that you can purchase. I do not make this myself. I put it in a jar so that I have it handy because I purchased it in a one gallon can. But it is a really, really good material or finish that's pure, organic, and food safe. And the way we apply this is we put on a thin coat. If you notice, I have a little cotton applicator. It's very small. It's actually a cut, cut off portion of a t-shirt. That was soaking in the finish and I squeegeed off all the excess of that before I started and then that one little applicator full of finish was enough to, to do this entire bowl. So I'm going around the entire bowl and putting a thin coat on and that's it. Now what the instructions recommend and the way I do this is I'll let this sit for an hour then I will go over and wipe it down and take off any excess or thick areas and then we let it sit for 24 hours. And that's what we're going to do next. All right, it's, it's looking really good. And I kind of go around it to make sure there's no high spots. What you really don't want is you don't want any thick spots because it'll get gummy. And we don't want that, obviously. All right, that's looking great. So we'll put this away and we'll let it set for 24 hours. I did come back in an hour and, and wipe it down one more time. But 24 hours later, you come back and the finish works itself into the wood really nice. And then what you do is you take a piece of 4 ot or 0000 steel wool. Just need a small piece of that. And you're going to burnish this. That's why I left this on the lathe as well. And turn the lathe on. And we're just going to start gently move this across the surface to burnish out the finish across the wood. You can see the luster changing there in the reflection from the light. And you'll get a little bit of buildup on the steel wool. You can just pull the steel wool apart and flip it over and use another section of it. And this is going to give the bowl a really nice sheen. Now it does take several days for this finish to cure into the wood, but you're ready to go. You can handle this and do anything you need to with it at this point. I'll do the same thing on the exterior of the bowl. Yeah, Tried and True makes a, a wonderful product. They do not pay me to endorse them. I just, I like their product a lot, be, mainly because it has no additives or chemicals or metals or anything added to it. It's linseed oil and beeswax and that's it. It's looking really good. Okay, now here's the measuring device. I wanted to show you this so you can see it a little closer. This is the calipers I use, the little gap in the top is the gap between the blue area and the top is what shows you the wall thickness and you can see how thick that is as you're moving across the bowl. I'll put a link to that in the description below as well. Okay so I'm going to use a jam chuck to reverse the bowl and turn the tenon and shoulder into a foot. This is an older jam chuck that I've used a lot and I also recommend making them large like this because this jam chuck is 
green wood that moves over time. As you can see, the front of this jam chuck has got a little bit of a wobble or vibration into it. So I simply need to go across and, and make a cut to shape the curve of this. And then I'm, I'm cutting out the inside. That way there's a larger area that grips the inside of the bowl. This way I also know that it's turning true. That little bit of wobble in there could cause a problem with the base of the bowl, and we don't want that. So I'm going to use a piece of padding, and I'll put that in between the jam chuck and the bowl. And I'll use the little pin point that's on the bottom of the bowl from earlier. Line that all up, apply a little pressure, and now we have access to the tenon and the shoulder, and we can remove that tenon and shape the foot of the bowl. So I'm using my half inch bowl gouge here, making push cuts into the headstock. This is a good way to maintain the stability of the mount. I'm not going 90 degrees against the, the mount itself, I'm going pretty much into the headstock. So this is a nice cut that's pretty stable. Just removing the material there. Now I'm going to level off the foot of the bowl. I'm going to make sure I've got a nice flat foot there. And now the inside of the base is going to be concave. So I just want the outside foot touching the tabletop. And I'm going to back cut just using the lower wing. This is a delicate cut. You want to be very careful doing this. Take your time. And then I'm going to remove that material. Now this is, again, this is a very open cut, but it's a very light cut. So take your time. Make super light cuts. If you try to get aggressive with this, you will get a catch. This is a dangerous position to have the bowl gouge in. If you're not comfortable doing that cut, you can also use a scraper. And I'm going to show you that here in a second. I'm going to use this flat scraper to get down into that corner and shape the bottom foot area. The concept here is to have the base of the bowl that's down here in the bottom essentially continue the curve of the sidewalls of the bowl. So the foot essentially looks like it was added on after the fact. All right, so I've got the area next to the foot the way I want it, and I'm going to continue curving the base of the bowl up to the nub, which we're going to need to remove. And I will do push cuts to reduce that and continue reducing that. Now, if you'd like, you can cut this off by hand, the, the remaining nub that you're seeing here, or you can sand it down. If you use a 80 or a 60 grit sandpaper, you can take the time and just sand that completely off. But before I remove that nub, I'm going to sand this foot area and kind of level that, especially inside the foot, and get that the way I want it. Now I'll continue with the bull gouge, but then I'll switch over to my spindle detail gouge for removing the nub on the bottom of him. Remember, we want pretty much all of the areas to have a smooth, fluid motion to it. So I'm picking up that inside portion with my spindle detail gouge here, just continuing that surface in towards the center, and I will nibble away and, and wedge down the nub until it's thinner and thinner and I can cut through it. Now this is also a good time to stop and check and make sure there's no imperfections in the wood that's in that little bit of a nub. If there is, you need to stop and just cut it off manually or and sand it away. Sometimes there's a crack or something in there that, that could be dangerous. So what I do is I remove it down to that very thin diameter apply some forward pressure and turn the lathe off and just let the gouge cut through the fibers and that's it
Whoa. <laughs> it almost got away from me there. Okay, so now I need to sand that nub away. Now what I'm doing is the edge of the sanding pad, I'm lining that up with the grain of the wood. Again, this is the surface grain, not the cutting grain that we talk about when we're using a bull gouge, but the surface grain. And I will rotate it around so I don't create a valley on one side. And I'm sliding it back and forth with the grain until that whole nub area is level with the rest of the bowl. And then once the foot area is ready, we can go ahead and sign that and get it ready for final finish. And here again, I'll be using the tried and true original finish. I'm just covering the areas that didn't have finish from before. The nice thing about this finish is that you can overlap, you can reapply it, you can put multiple coats on if you'd like. I would recommend letting the first coat cure but it's very forgiving and you can come back and touch it up very easily as you can see here. I will let this sit overnight and then I will buff out the base of this bowl by hand just like we did with the rest of it. And there's our bowl. Look at that wood grain pattern. Now this is the pattern I was mentioning at the beginning that is revealed when you put the pith at the bottom of the bowl. This is the same orientation that a live edge bowl or a natural edge bowl has with the pith down at the bottom. Look at that wood grain. So here it is, a relatively thin walled bowl considering its overall size. Now this isn't a huge bowl, but it's a pretty good sized bowl. I would consider it a medium sized bowl. This is a great bowl for fruit or for popcorn or a lot of things. And it looks great. I love the grain of this wood and the finish from the tried and true original finish just looks great on this. All in all, I think this worked out really good. And I hope you guys realized how simple that little trick is to make the walls appear just a little bit thinner than what you've actually turned. And that's a good thing because we could take a bowl this size and yeah, you could take your time and, and turn it paper thin, but you're probably not gonna be able to use it much. And if it were to fall off the countertop just once, it's gonna shatter all over the place. Instead, we have a reasonably thick wall that has some functionality, so it's not gonna get destroyed if something happens to it. It's gonna have a little bit of durability, although it looks thin and elegant, and that's the cool trick about making this appear just that much more thinner on the top. So I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, do me a huge favor and click that like button below the screen and subscribe if you're not already. Be sure to check out my website, turnawoodbowl.com. I've got tons of information there. I also have three courses there. I've got turning wood bowls from start to finish. I've got treat a bowl, understanding green wood, and tool sharpening. Tool sharpening is probably the most important. If you're just getting started, you're probably gonna to wanna to start there because sharp tools makes everything so much easier. Then understanding wood, which is the tree to bowl, and then the turning course, of, of course. Of course, of course. <laughs> All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this. If you have, leave me a comment below. Let me know what you think. And as always, until next time, happy turning.